Thank you. So it's, it's great, great to be here. And you can't go anywhere today without hearing about new amazing things being done with machine learning. We just heard from Tudor about a system that can read research papers and do competitively well compared to 10 years of, of human effort. Um, you can see that you may not be able to recognize my post-impressionistic drawing of a mosquito, but Google can. And all of these machine learning techniques seem to be solving all the problems we have in security now. We heard from Matt this morning about what they're doing at WhatsApp with very impressive results on spam. Nearly every problem we have in computer security seems like a classification problem that is just well suited to being solved by machine learning. What I want to do in my talk is raise some questions about how confident we can be in machine learning based classifiers and tell you about some work that my group is doing at the University of Virginia to try to answer that question. All of these machine learning techniques start from a, a general model where you start with training data. If you're lucky, you have a lot of it and it's labeled. And you have some algorithm that builds a model based on that training data. And then you deploy that and you hope it gives you good results. And the premise behind all of this is the assumption that the data that you will encounter in the deployment is similar to the data that you had for training. In the real world, this is often not the case. And in an adver adversarial context, where an adversary is trying to adapt to the model that you released, that's the worst case for the deployment data not being like the training data. So there are two issues that could come up. The first is the adversary may be able to impact the training data. This is what's known as a poisoning attack. The adversary generates some samples, gets them somehow into your training data, and that causes the training process to lead to a bad model. I'm not going to go into that more today. There's definitely been a lot of interesting work on poisoning attacks. I'm going to assume, in this case, that the adversary doesn't have any access to your training data, that you're able to build a model on clean training data. You deploy it. And then the adversary has a goal that they would like to find samples that your classifier misclassifies. This is called an evasion attack. And that's what I'll focus on today. And so the goal of our work is to understand classifiers in the presence of adversaries. We want to automatically simulate what an adaptive adversary will do to try to evade a classifier. We hope this will improve our understanding of classifier robustness and maybe even enable us to build better classifiers Although in some cases, what it might do is force us to give up, realize that this approach can't, can't actually work. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of PDF malware. PDF malware is something that I think doesn't get very much attention from our community. And I think that stems from some of the things we, we heard about yesterday about having the Snowden threat model. So all of us know they're very easy solutions to not be a victim of PDF malware. You open your PDFs in a sandbox reader, and you have very little to worry about. For the typical end user, that solution is not what they're doing. And there are many, many cases of PDF malware being used for high value attacks. Congressional staffers open PDFs, they, they get in their email. People working in, in banks in Bangladesh do as well. And a lot of the ransomware attacks use this as their threat vector of, of launching malware on a, on a victim. And it doesn't seem this is going to go away. Uh, Adobe Acrobat seems to have more and more bugs each year. We already have 33 new vulnerabilities in 2017. So. so there are many PDF malware classifiers. We've looked at these three that we think are representative of the state of the art. Um, they all have high accuracy scores when tested on data that is similar to their training data. The methods that we have are not particular to a particular classification technique. Um, but the two that I'll focus on most are using random forest. So I'm going to explain a little how that works, which will help understand our results. So the way a random forest works is you randomly generate a large number of decision trees. They're bigger and more of them than you can see on the slide. And the decision tree, each of the yellow nodes is a feature. And based on that feature, you follow a path in the tree. And you train all of these trees independently. And then it's a forest. You've got many trees. You select the trees that work best. And then when you're classifying a sample, you vote on the result. The difference between the two random forest classifiers we're going to look at 
is what they use for features. So the first is PDF rate, and that uses human engineered features, properties of a PDF file, like the counts of certain objects and the positions of elements of that file. The other is the high-dose classifier, which was designed in particular to resist mimicry attacks, so it's designed with evasion in mind, and it uses automated features that are structural paths in the PDF files. So let me tell you about the technique for automatically evading, and it's based on ideas from genetic programming. So our goal is to find evasive variants. So what an evasive, evasive variant means, it's a variant that has the same malicious behavior as an original seed. We're assuming that we start with some malicious PDF that the attacker has created that has the desirable to the attacker behavior, but is classified as malicious by the classifier, so it's not useful in the attack. What the attacker wants to find is a variant of that PDF that has the same malicious behavior, but is now classified as benign. So to start this process, we need a seed. The seed's the malicious PDF, and a PDF file is got several parts to it, but the main body of it is an abstract syntax tree. So we can break that down into the components, and they form a tree structure. So to create variations on a seed, we need to manipulate that tree structure. So we start by parsing it. So we have a modified parser that is robust to the kinds of changes that happen in malware. So often malware is designed to not be parsed by analysis tools, so it doesn't follow the grammar correctly. So we need to be a little careful in parsing to, to be able to resist that. And then we've generated our parse of the um, PDF, and what we want to do is manipulate it. So to generate variants, the strategy is to just randomly manipulate it. So very simple heuristics, standard techniques in genetic programming. We select some random node. For that node, we select some random operation. And the operation could be delete that node, and that would delete the node and everything below that node in the tree. We could also select to insert. Insert, we need to pick some new node to insert, and the pool of nodes to insert come from benign PDFs. So we selected from a Google search, just file type PDFs, and selected a small number of those, and in fact, you need very few, three is an F for our experiments, that are rated as highly benign by the classifier. And so we'll select a random node from those highly benign PDFs, put it where the random node was selected to try to create a new variant. So now we've constructed all those variants. What we need to do is select ones that seem promising. If we're really lucky, maybe we already found an invasive variant. But for, in most cases, that's not going to happen. We need to evolve to find the ones that will successfully evade the classifier. And so to do that, we need a fitness function. We need a way of selecting the ones that are most promising. The fitness function we use takes two components. So the first is an oracle that tests if it still has the malicious behavior. So we have a big advantage here that we know the target malware behavior. And this is similar to what the adversary would certainly have. Right? If we really had an oracle that worked on all possible samples, well, we wouldn't need a classifier. We would be done. But in this case, we just need to execute it in the vulnerable environment, look at the behavior, and see if it matches the known malicious behavior that the original seed had. If it does, we consider it malicious. If not, we consider it a, fa a failure. The other input to the fitness function is the score from the classifier. So we need some access to the target classifier, but all we use is the score. We don't have any internal information about it. We don't have any access to any internal data structures. But we do have the score that comes out of it, which is how close it is to being benign or malicious. And so we compute the fitness function. If it's malicious, we assume it's, um, we look at the score. If it's getting closer to benign, that's good. If the oracle says, I don't see the malicious behavior anymore, we assume we're unlikely to get that back by more random changes, so we throw that one out. So that's the lowest possible fitness score. OK, so does it work? So both of our classifiers tested against non-adversarial samples are very accurate, have quite low false negative rates. Once we run the evasion process, those false neg negative rates go to one. So we're able to find an evasive variant that's classified as benign 
that has the malicious behavior for all of the seeds in our sample set. So looking at those variants gives us some insight into why this is. So here we have the number of mutations needed to find the evasive variant and for the two classifiers. So there are 500 seeds, so once they get to the 500, there's an evasive variant for each of those seeds. And you can see there's some seeds where very simple transformations worked. We only needed a small number of mutations. In fact, one was enough for over 160 of the seeds in PDF rate. And what this transformation is doing is just inserting a page. So this is something that probably does not break the malicious behavior for most seeds. Not hard for a malware author to do. And the fact that it works tells us that the training set has an artifact. And the artifact in the training set that's not relevant to intrinsically malicious properties of the PDFs is that lots of malicious PDFs are constructed in a lazy way. They don't bother to put any actual pages of content in them. All real benign PDFs probably actually have some pages of content in them. So the classifier learns this as a feature, but it's a useless feature if an adversary wants to adapt to it. There are other samples where large numbers of transformations were needed. So here we needed over 300 mutations to find an evasive variant for that particular seed. And you can see the kinds of transformations were both inserting and deleting nodes in those PDF files. So genetic programming has a reputation for being very expensive. Um, but in this case, it's really quite practical. So this is the total cost to do this, just running on a, a commodity desktop PC. Um, it takes a, a bit over a, 120 hours to find all 500 variants against the PDF rate classifier. And this is you know, about 15 minutes per variant. Once you've learned, the, as, as you develop more variants, it gets faster because you can reuse many of the traces that you found and they work on new seeds as well. Okay, so are there any defenses? So there's several possible defenses that, that people have proposed, um, and none of the simple ones seem to work. So one idea would be to adjust the threshold. If you look at the actual classifier scores, so the original seeds are all rated very close to one, fully malicious. That's the highest malicious score you can get. And the threshold is fairly arbitrary where you set that, but it's set at 0.5. And if you look at the evasive variants that are found, well, most of them are pretty close to 0.5. So maybe we should vary that threshold score and make it harder. What happens when you vary it? Well, we can run the evasive process and find variants at a lower threshold. So at some point, you can find a threshold where everything is going to be classified as benign, but that's not going to be very useful either. So this is for PDF rate. The results for high dose are very similar. So another possibility would be to retrain the classifier. And there's some domains where it seems like this, this is promising, and Nicholas may mention some work in that area in the next talk. The idea here is that you, instead of just deploying the classifier that you found, you should test that classifier against possible evasion attempts. And that's certainly something that I think people should start to understand is important to do for any security purpose. And what you hope happens if you've got a technique like EvadeML or some other technique for fighting evasive variants, well, as you find those evasive variants, you're going to introduce those in the training and retrain the classifier with evasive variants you found. And you hope if you go through this loop enough times, that you'll end up with a classifier that performs well and is hard to evade. So here's the results of, of doing this. So here's Hydos, the original classifier. It takes 614 generations to find evasive variants for all of the seeds. If we use the variants that are found with that and retrain the classifier, we'll call that retrained one, now we run the evasion process again, and it takes a little longer. So this looks pretty encouraging. So let's try it again. We'll take the evasive variants that we found against the retrain classifier, retrain the classifier again, and now we're getting a line that's starting to look like, well, it took 800 generations and only uh, about 10% of the seeds have evasive variants. So this looks very promising. Any problems with this? Should we keep going? 
Well, we, we've got to look at more than just availability. We've got to look at whether the classifier is still useful. And the big problem with this retraining is it affects the false positive rates. Right? So what the classifier is really learning is not getting better at recognizing malware. What it's learning is recognizing the benign parts that are incorporated in the variants. So if you look at the first column here, these are the false positive rates on the files that were selected to use for the benign nodes inserted into the variants. And the second column is, those are the rates for a, another data set of benign nodes. So we're getting up to 50% false positive rates, clearly unacceptable for a classifier that could be used. There's one scenario where, where we did find this seemed to be pretty successful, and that's if you can assume that you can retrain with both the evasive variants and under the assumption that the operator, the classifier, knows all of the benign samples that are available to the adversary. This is a very unrealistic assumption for any context I can think of, because the adversary probably has a way to find new benign variants, uh, new benign fi files to use to find that. OK, so another possible defense would be to try to hide the classifier. So hiding things generally is not a popular idea in the security community, security through obscurity. But in this case, maybe it will work. And the reason it might work is part of the evolutionary strategy depends on getting the score from the target classifier. So if we can hide that, and it would still be a useful classifier if it just outputs benign or malicious and doesn't give us any score out. If it's an online classifier, we can hide that score from a potential adversary. So this raises the question of, could the adversary still find evasive samples without access to the classifier that they're trying to evade? And in some cases, it looks kind of promising. So if you assume the adversary had access to PDF rate, but not to high dose, most of the evasive samples found against PDF rate are not evasive against high dose. And this reflects the design goals of high dose to not be vulnerable to those types of evasion attacks. If we flip them, the results are not so good. Most of the evasive variants that are found against high dose do work against PDF rate. A more interesting question is if, if we think about this for a classifier that is really a black box, at least to me, uh, such as Gmail, which I have no access to other than using it as my, my mailer and have no information about what it does, and we don't get any information out of other than benign or malicious. This actually looks sort of promising that it might be hard to evade Gmail, that only six of the variants that were found with high dose were successful against Gmail. The danger here is that, well, those six actually tell the adversary a lot. So you can use those six to learn the properties that that classifier is probably using, and it didn't take the grad student who did this long to come up with a few lines of code that now make most of the variants evasive against Gmail. So this cross-evasion problem is a very, very interesting problem. This is something Nicholas is going to talk a lot more about in the next talk and have some very interesting results about. So to conclude, I think that the big story here is that if you build a classifier and the features are artifacts of your training data and are superficial and don't really reflect what you're trying to recognize, the adversary can find ways to manipulate those features and have your classifier produce the wrong results. So I want to conclude with two points. The first is that domain knowledge is not dead. I think data science seems to be taking over the world, and in some areas it will. Um, I think those of us who work in security are lucky that that's not going to happen to us. I think we have long-term job security that um, any classifier that is used for a security purpose cannot be used without understanding a lot about the domain that it's being used in. And if we are going to trust our classifiers, we need to understand both the classifier and the problems that we're solving much better, to know if the reasoning that is embedded into that model has something to do with what we're actually looking for, or it's just an artifact of the way that we trained it. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I would welcome your questions and comments. Um, you can go to the website there, get access to all of our source code and papers and, and data. Thank you, Dave.